up on a continual basis. And if you weren't here Wednesday night, you really missed the treat. Not only because we had an opportunity to gather together in fellowship and had an opportunity to study and be stirred up in the Word of God, uh, but also, of course, like we do every Wednesday night, uh, we have an opportunity to sing together as well as hear a devotional from God's Word from one of the faithful brethren here in the congregation. I'm certainly thankful uh, for that. We just sang a song a few minutes ago, uh, and hopefully you could have answered in the affirmative, are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother? Uh, are you sowing the seed? And as we strive to do so, oftentimes we come across certain situations where other folks are trying to sow their seed. They're trying to sow their doctrine, their belief system, their understanding uh, of what men have taught them and uh, what maybe mom and dad or grandma and grandpa have taught them. And as we experience these types of situations, we might find ourselves in studies where we are trying to present the truth of the gospel, while at the same time, they are trying to present their ideology. They're trying to present their ideas. And certainly, this should not discourage us, and it should not cause us to shy away from them and shy away from those types of studies. But rather, as we continue to engage in such evangelistic practices, we will find uh, common trends and common uh, situations that folks generally tend to uh, find their favorite kind of go-to approach to salvation, and we can become quite familiar with their understanding, and then as well how we can respond to it, and how we can hopefully teach them the gospel and sow the seed of truth into their minds and into their hearts. One of the approaches that folks will use is what's called the Roman road. In other words, if I'm trying to teach someone the gospel, I'm going to use the book of Romans and I'm going to take them on a journey down the Roman road so that they can end up in a saved state with God. Now that may be something you're familiar with. It may not be something you're familiar with. If you are familiar with it, and maybe you weren't sure exactly how to deal with it at the time, now hopefully we can study this topic together. If you're not familiar with it, you thought, well, I've never heard someone say that before, then this is a preparatory course so that you can be ready, because quite often our denominational friends will use an approach such as this so you can be prepared. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it is a fellow classmate, someone at school. Maybe it's a teammate on one of your sports teams. Maybe it's a co-worker. Maybe it's a family member that you're going to be studying with or talking with about Jesus one day, and they might try to use this type of an approach. And one of the things that we're going to look at in this study is what we can do as we become stronger in our knowledge, in our conviction, and how comfortable we are with God's plan of salvation is to stay with people in their own approach, but to question, to ask, and to challenge them regarding the way and the direction that they are trying to go in. So we might be tempted, for example, to try to divert ourselves immediately out of the book of Romans if someone was trying to take us in this kind of approach. And we might try to run over to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. And go to that verse. Or we might try to run over immediately to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 and use that verse. Uh, and certainly those would be accurate approaches. Those would be correct verses. Those verses matter just as much as these verses that we're about to look at matter. But folks will really be challenged and they'll really have a difficult time remaining steadfast in their error if you stick with them where they are. And if you really question them and leave that question in their court and really provoke them to think more deeply about how and why and what it is really they're trying to do. So look with me here in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Look with me here in verse 16. Paul here is writing and says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Paul here is really setting up a thesis or an overarching theme as to what the book of Romans is all about. 
And really what it is he's trying to describe and explain and flesh out in the next several verses, passages, and chapters. For example, in Romans chapter 1, Paul is primarily dealing with the Gentile people. This is a people that were not of the Hebrew nation. This was a people that uh, had veered off from God's uh, plan regarding the way in which he spoke to the patriarchs in the beginning of time. God dealt with initially the heads of the families. He dealt, he dealt with specifically and directly with Adam. And then he dealt with specifically and directly with Noah and then Abraham, so on and so forth. Well, during the patriarchal age, there was a whole lot of people that decided they didn't want to have anything to do with God. They were going to leave God, they were going to ignore His commandments, and they were going to go off and do the things that they wanted to do and how they wanted to do them. Well, eventually, God ended up then establishing His law through Moses, the Old Testament law, uh, who are the Jewish people. These are the people who were called Jewish people because of Judah, Judah being the main tribe because it would be through that tribe that Jesus Christ would eventually come out and be born. And so Paul here is addressing the gospel and its relevance. And he says, hey, the gospel, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Yes, to the Jewish people and also to the Greeks, also to the barbarians, also to the Gentile people. And so in Romans chapter 1, then he goes on, verses 18 through 32, hey, Gentile people, this is why you need God. You've left God. You chose to go your own way and do your own things. And so God gave you up, verse 24. God gave you up, verse 26. God gave you up, verse 28. You were disobedient to the Lord because you engaged in various lifestyles and behaviors that are contrary to the will of God, verses 29 through 32. You need the gospel. You can imagine the Jewish people as this first chapter is being read. They're beating on their chest and they're thinking, go, Paul, go. Give it to the Gentiles. Then in chapter 2, Paul then therefore goes in to the Jewish people and to their own behaviors. Verse 1, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest dost the same things. Hey Jew, <laughs> you, you think you're free from condemnation? You think that somehow because you're of the seed of Abraham that you are not in need of the gospel? Well, you are in the need, uh, in need of the gospel. And as a matter of fact, because of your own behavior, because of your own missteps, because of your own idolatry, even the Gentiles point their finger at you and say, what a bunch of hypocrites. Notice with me in verse 24. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written, for circumcision verily profited if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the, of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. In other words, you're not doing what God says. Yes, you're circumcised. Yes, you're coming from the seed of Abraham. Yes, you are the Jewish people, but you're disobeying God's law. Just like the Gentiles need the gospel, Jews you need the gospel. And it is within the gospel that the righteousness of God is revealed. Notice there again, verse 17 of Romans chapter 1. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Therein what? The gospel, verse 16. Go with me now to chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 23, here's the summation of the Gentile people being dealt with in chapter 1. The Jewish people being dealt with in chapter 2. Paul then comes to a conclusion in verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All people of all types need the gospel. Verse 25, whom God hath set forth, that is Christ Jesus, note verse 24, to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. In other words, the gospel was God's plan all along. God told Adam and Eve in the garden in verse 17 of chapter 2 that they would die. 
that they were not to be eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eve understood this as she explains this to the serpent in Genesis chapter 3. How did that death then get carried out? What violent death was eventually then used because of the sins of mankind? Jesus Christ. And so the righteousness, the justice of God is declared via the gospel. Jesus Christ is the sacrifice because all of mankind have sinned. And all need the gospel. And so how then are folks going to get it? How are we going to even become aware of the gospel? Well, let's stay on the Roman road. Go with me to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And look with me here, beginning in verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The gospel is the source, is the authority of God by which mankind can be saved. But folks, mankind must first hear that message. They must understand that message. And in order for that to happen, preachers, teachers, those that are declaring it, must indeed declare it so that it can be heard and it can be understood. The gospel is not something that if you want to be right with God, you can take your Bible, you can put it under your pillow, and then eventually God's word is just going to migrate into your brain. It's not going to happen that way. The gospel is not going to be heard and is not going to be understood because simply your parents do what God <coughs> says and bring you physically here to this building. You're not going to learn the gospel just because you're sitting in a pew. Learning the gospel requires, number one, the teaching of it, but number two, the hearing, the reading, the studying, the understanding of it. So in order for folks to actually have access to this source of salvation, the plan of salvation... God's word must be heard. Then it also must believe. Be believed. You heard what Paul said there in chapter 1 of verse 16. He's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes. A belief. In the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Salvation is not possible without that belief. Staying there in Romans chapter 10, look with me here in verse 11. Paul writes once again regarding belief. He says, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Belief is required. Now, who is it that Paul is dealing with in the context of this chapter? He's coming back to his Jewish brethren. In other words, brethren via the lineage of Abraham. Brethren in the flesh. And he's hurt. He's conflicted. Because of the knowledge that they have regarding the one true and only living God, but their unwillingness to actually do what it is that God has delivered forth for them to obey. And so Paul explains, beginning there in verse 1 of Romans chapter 10, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might 
be saved. The nation of Israel, the Old Testament people of God, the Jewish people, the people that were dealt with in chapter 2, they're not saved. And my prayer to God, what is prayer? It's defined for us actually right here, side lesson altogether. Paul has a desire, his heart's desire, his mind's desire, his focus. What does that translate into? It translates into prayer. When Paul desires something, what does he do about it? He prays to God about it. And so Paul desires that his Jewish brethren, the nation of Israel, be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, verse 2, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now why is Paul dealing with belief then later on in the chapter? He's dealing with belief because of the conviction and because of their allegiance and loyalty to the Old Testament law. They're not willing to give it up. They're not willing to put aside the law of Moses. They're not willing to say the Old Testament has been completed. It's finished. It's now time to no longer be the nation of Israel, but it's time to be the nation under Christ. Paul acknowledges here the zeal that they have. The fact that indeed they want God. There is a sincerity there. There's a passion there. There's a zealousness, a drive when it comes to being with God. Paul says it's not according to knowledge. You're not actually in step with what God wants. And so the gospel must be heard and it must be believed. <clears throat> And the challenges that you have as a Jewish people regarding the Christ, the one that you put up on the cross, you must overcome those. You must believe that he is the Messiah and you must confess such. Verse 10, he explains, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Jewish people, my brethren, physically, in the flesh, my fellow citizens in the Israel nation, if you want to be right with God, you must believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. You must confess that he is God. Matter of fact, he says as well in verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Give up your allegiance to the Old Testament law. The purpose of the goal of it all was Christ, verse 4. The whole reason it was even delivered was so that Christ could come about, verse 4. It's time for you to embrace the gospel. And so Paul here is in actuality dealing with one of the primary factors of salvation, which is repentance. He's explaining to them the need for them to believe, the need for them to confess. Certainly none of this is possible without actually hearing and understanding the gospel. But penitence, a change of mind, a willingness to say, I'm not going to do it based upon the law of Moses any longer. I'm not going to try to obey the Old Testament law. I'm now going to cleave unto Christ and unto the gospel. That he died and that he was resurrected and that he is the one that I should obey. It's time to repent. 
So therefore, we have the context then of chapter 10. But in the Roman road approach by our denominational friends, oftentimes this is where we would stop. We would cease our study at this point. We would then ask the individual whether or not they understood what was read here. Confession would be desired. A questioning of the belief of the individual with whom we were studying would be asked. And we would go on our way. But folks, the Roman road is not complete. There's more in this book that Paul deals with. One of the challenges about preaching is, believe it or not, there's so much to say. And oftentimes when there's a certain aspect that is being dealt with regarding behavior and the life, belief of folks, in order to deal with that appropriately, a whole lot of attention and focus needs to be given in isolation with that specific trait and issue. But then, given the context of other individuals and given the context of how that is heard and understood, because that's being dealt with in isolation, other folks may misunderstand it and take away and think, well, this is then the chief thing. None of this other stuff matters, obviously. This is the one thing that I need to deal with. And so oftentimes, preachers are tasked with dealing with that one issue in isolation while at the same time trying to emphasize <coughs> What the preacher is not saying, what is not being taught, what also needs to be considered. But when that is done, oftentimes there is a certain amount of strength that is taken away from the core argument and from the core issue that needs to be dealt with at all. And so notice here that Paul in no way gets into any other matters in Romans chapter 10. Check with me, but I don't see the word baptism in this entire chapter. And you might think for a second, as our denominational friends do, hey, let's just stay here in Romans chapter 10. We'll read verses 1 through verse 17, and we'll call it a day. But folks, in the context of what Paul is dealing with in the letter, what is the core issue regarding these Jewish people? Do they have a problem with baptism? Are they wrestling with whether or not baptism is essential? If you do a study of baptism, not for salvation, not baptism into Christ, but if you just do a study of the act of baptizing, in other words, literally being immersed in water, just that act, folks, it was something that's been done for a long time. The Jewish people were familiar with it. It was a practice that had occurred prior to Jesus commanding it, essential for salvation. And so the Jewish people, in Romans chapter 10, Paul's heart's desire, his prayer to God, is not that the Jewish people just, quote, be baptized. It's the fact that they are lacking in a belief and in an understanding, and in a conviction, and in a zeal according to knowledge regarding the Messiah. And there's an unwillingness on their part to confess it. There's an unwillingness on their part to truly believe it, and cleave to it, and give up their old practices, their old ways, their old traditions. They don't want to give that up. And so in Romans chapter 10, Paul's going to muddy the water. He's going to take away from the core argument that he's trying to deal with with these Jewish people regarding what they need in order to be converted. Which is a belief and a confession in Christ. And folks, once they believe, once they confess, Paul knows that they've repented. They've changed their mind. They've given it up. 
And so after that point, being baptized isn't a problem. And in Romans chapter 6, Paul deals with what the brethren there in Rome, those who were already Christians, did in order to be right with God. The Roman road is not just Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, and then flip over Romans chapter 10. We can go in that order. But we're going to have a bridge not finished yet and fall to the bottom of the cliff if we stop there in Romans chapter 10. We've got to go back now to Romans chapter 6. And Paul explains unto them, notice in verse 3 beginning, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Now, what had Paul said in chapter 1 and verse 16? He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. What did he say in Romans chapter 10? Romans chapter 10 in verse 9, he says, If thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, in Romans 6 and verse 3, what Paul is dealing with here is the fact that those who were baptized were baptized into the death of Christ. Does that matter? Absolutely. That's a piece of the gospel. That's a part of the belief. That's a part of what they would be confessing. Why would someone confess that they believe Jesus Christ died, confess and believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, then not actually align themselves with that death. These brethren in Rome had already done so. They had been baptized into the death of Christ. Verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. Oh, the gospel saves? I need to believe and confess that Jesus Christ died and was raised from the dead? Okay, and when I'm baptized, I'm baptized into his death? That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Okay, so I'm now resurrected with Christ. Verse 5, Paul here offers and gives us what is called a conditional statement. You and I wanted to go play, let's say maybe a round of golf. And I said, well, if you want to go play a round of golf, take me out to lunch first and then we'll go play a round of golf. Well, if you really wanted to go play a round of golf, what would then be required in order for us to actually go do that? Based upon that statement, we'd have to go out for lunch. Now, could you just hop over that and say, well, I'm not going to take you out for lunch, but let's go play a round of golf. I said, no, no, didn't you hear what I just said? If you really want to play a round of golf, let me take me out for lunch. What am I making? I'm making a conditional statement. Romans, the book of it, is a legal letter. Paul is explaining things in legal terms. And he's explaining here in verse 5, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, well, how do we do that? Verses 3 and 4 tells us. If, if, conditional, if, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. I want to spend eternity with Jesus Christ. Do you really? Do you really want to be with God in heaven for eternity? If the answer to that question is yes, that means you'll meet the conditions. That means that you will align yourself to the likeness of the death of Christ via baptism by being buried and immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. And at that point, based upon your belief and confession in Christ, you then will be in the likeness of his resurrection. He goes on and explains in verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, 
Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. In other words, you have now made a decision to give up your sinful life. And upon being baptized, you then live a life that is far different from the life you were living prior to being baptized. If you were disobedient to parents, you now live a life where you're obedient to parents. If you were lying, you now live a life where you're not lying. If you were a thief, you're now living a life where you're no longer a thief. If you were a drunkard, you now live a life where you're no longer a drunkard. If you were an adulterer, a fornicator, an idolater, etc., you now live a life where you have given those things up. You no longer allow it to reign, to have dominion. You no longer serve it, is what Paul is saying. He's not saying you're not going to never sin. He's saying now that you belong to Christ, you don't serve sin anymore. You don't allow it to have dominion over you. You now live for a different purpose. For a different objective. And that purpose is the gospel. The Roman road, in its entirety, based upon what the book of Romans provides to us, gives us salvation. But folks, we have to understand and we have to be willing to embrace and obey every piece of it. I got a chance yesterday to help make some chicken salad. So if you try it today and you don't like it, it's my fault. If it's good, that's because of Hannah. But you know, in making chicken salad, I didn't know what went into chicken salad. You need all different kinds of ingredients. Well, folks, if you just had grapes, you're not eating chicken salad, you're eating grapes. If you just had, I think it was like a half a cup of mayo, you're just having a half a cup of mayo. You're not having chicken salad. If you're having chicken, then you're having chicken, you're not having chicken Salad, celery, so on and so forth. Does God say we have to believe in order to be saved? Absolutely. Does God say that we have to repent in order to be saved? Absolutely. Does he say that we have to confess in order to be saved? Absolutely. But he says the exact same thing about baptism. Now the question is, are you saved? Are you right with God? If not, take a trip down the Roman road. Follow it all the way through. Obey the gospel before it's everlastingly too late. Because those that obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be eternally separated from God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 7 through 9. Do you want to be eternally separated from God? If not, why don't you obey this morning? Brother